All right, well, good to see everybody tonight, and want to get started continuing on where we were last week. We started a new principle last week. Uh, the principle is Scripture interprets other Scripture. And we talked for a little while last week. I, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and look at the video a little bit, kind of introducing this principle, that it's not just a defensive uh, tactic. That when we come across Bible verses that seem to contradict each other or... Uh, when we come across passages that are hard to understand, this is a principle that does come into play a lot of times, but it's not, it didn't come primarily from us trying to figure out how to, what to do with difficult passages. It came out of the Reformation, and uh, the teachers at that time reminded us that it wasn't church tradition and it wasn't what the scholars said about the Bible that was the best interpreter of the Bible. We went back to the Bible itself to find out how best to understand what the Bible is actually teaching. So while all of those other things can definitely be helpful, and I encourage you all to use study Bibles and different tools that you have to help you understand the Bible, none of those is infallible, none of those is authoritative. The only one that we have that is authoritative is to go back to the Bible itself. So with this principle, we've been giving some examples of passages that are a little bit hard to understand sometimes, sometimes a, a little difficult to interpret, and we've been looking at some specific examples where we can compare one scripture with another scripture, or sometimes a, a list of different verses, to help us understand how that first original passage, uh, what it really means, and how it fits into the context of the entire Bible. So we're going to continue on with those examples. We did three examples last week, and our goal was to do four examples this week. We'll finish up, uh, and then next week we'll move on to another principle, and um, I haven't decided for sure what it's going to be, but I'm kind of leaning toward uh, dealing some with original languages and translation and how do we, how does, how do, how does the original Greek and Hebrew affect how we interpret and understand the Bible as well, and how do you access that? As um, most Christians don't have training in Greek <coughs> and Hebrew, so if there is something to be added to our understanding of the Bible in those areas. How do you access that without actually taking the time to be in a class and learn the language? So we are going to deal with that at some point. I think it's going to be next week, but I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about that. But, but next week we will be on another, um, another principle. But today, uh, last week we did the examples of um, James 2.24 was the last one we did. And his statement about, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. We did Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And we did a Luke 14.26, where Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and, and children, such a person cannot be my disciple. So some interesting verses last week, and I think we got some more good ones tonight. We get started tonight. Our first example comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. So let's go ahead and turn there. And we'll probably also look at Romans 5.18 because you deal with basically the same issue in both of those passages. 1 Corinthians 15.22 Somebody like to read that verse for us? For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. <coughs> Alright, thanks Richard. So we've got verse in the Bible, Paul's writings, that could be taken, and is sometimes taken by some people, to teach that basically everybody's going to be saved in the end. A uh, number of different, different passages are used by people who believe in the teaching of universal salvation or universalism. Uh, and this is one of the most prominent of those verses. Romans 5 is another one. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And uh, you'll have different groups, and not always tied in with this issue, but you'll, you'll have some people that uh, really harp on the idea that when the Bible says all, it really means all. So uh, you kind of get yourself in trouble a little bit with that uh, if you want to take that tack on interpreting other verses, because uh, if all always means all, then... How do we understand all in the second part of 1 Corinthians 15.22 is a 
pretty significant question. Well, so if all die in Adam, and all are made alive in Christ, then it sounds like sin enters the world and everybody becomes a sinner, and then because of Jesus' sacrifice, all sin is forgiven, so everybody's made alive then. Let's look at Romans 5.18 and give you another example. Very similar uh, situations going on here in Romans 5.18. This one may be even a little bit stronger than the First Corinthians passage. It might depend on how you look at it a little bit. But somebody read Romans 5.18. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. All right, thanks, man. So what's the one trespass that he's talking about there? The fall. Yeah, the fall. So Adam's sin, that's, that's the context of Romans Chapter 5, so one trespass, Adam's fall, resulted in condemnation for all people. So one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. And there, there's parallel statements about all people there, which you can turn that into a, a fairly strong argument if you're just looking at these two verses alone in isolation from what the rest of the Bible teaches. That sound like all people are going to be justified because of what Jesus did. Now... You and I know because of our reading of the rest of the Bible that that doesn't seem to be the teaching of many, many other passages. And we'll look at a couple of those in just a minute. But how do you understand these fitting together? And, how, and that's really what our principle is looking at tonight. How do you fit verses like this that in some ways seem to take, and some people could take to mean, well, everybody's going to be saved in the end. In fact, uh, there was one prominent pastor. Well, he's not a pastor anymore. He was a pastor about two or three years ago. Maybe he came out with a book called Love Wins. His name was Rob Bell. And uh, his thesis in that was that in the end, God's going to save everybody. I, I think, I didn't read the book. Um, I didn't think there was really any need to. I mean, just, all the arguments run together and they all get rehashed over and over again. But it I think he kind of had some kind of purgatory-like idea where some people might be punished for a while in hell, but eventually God's going to purify them from all their sin and everybody's going to be saved in the end. That's the idea of the title is that love wins and God's going to love everybody in the end and everybody's going to end up in heaven. So this teaching gets reformulated and taught throughout church history at different times in different ways. And universal passages like this are ones that are really used prominently by people that teach this kind of thing. So. Yeah, but if you, if you rearrange the words a, a little bit, mm -hmm. you said, so all in Christ will be made alive. If you just rearrange it just a little bit. Yeah. That's, true. That's definitely true with 1 Corinthians 15. So, and I think that is a legitimate argument and understanding of 1 Corinthians 15. But you don't really have that to fall back on in Romans 5. Because you don't have the in Christ language being used there. Um, you just have him talking about one trespass is condemnation for all people, one righteous act resulted in justification in life for all people. But verse 17 does specify. It says that those who receive Christ's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness, righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, so to me, if you're reading above that, he's saying, yes, that those who receive his, <coughs> his provision that he's provided his grace, his gift. Yeah, yeah. So and, I, and I agree that, that there, first. Even, the, even the immediate context of these passages makes it hard to, to think that these verses are unequivocally teaching universal salvation. You kind of have to discount some other things that are in the nearby context to take it to mean that. And, and I certainly agree with that. Um, but the, these still are strong verses, at least taken in isolation. Uh, on this subject. Um, well, one way to look at this verse is, is uh, this one in particular, is that why do we all die because of what Adam did? Because we inherited his sin. Because he had descendants and we are all descendants of Adam. Well, Christ didn't have physical descendants. So how are you just a, a descendant of Christ? You know, spiritually, through faith. Mm -hmm. So the one way to look at that is, yes, we're all descendants of Adam, so we all die. However, those descendants of Christ will be made alive. Well, how do you become a descendant of Christ? Not all people are descendants of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a 
this year. Yeah. If you pick verses, one verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's all it's over for all of us. Yeah. If you just want to pick one oh, verse. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about what's it called universalism. That's what they were calling it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the idea that everyone everyone will ultimately be saved, but that's not Paul's point. He is simply contrasting. And the actions of Adam and Christ, Adam's life, disobedience brought death. Jesus' life brought yeah. life. Yeah. Well, mine, says, oh. mine says, except for Red Sox fans. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> right Ultimately, what you have that's going on in both of these verses <laughs> is that Adam is being pictured as the head of the first humanity, and his trespass, his act, is going to influence all of the first humanity. And Christ is the head of the second humanity, and Christ's act is going to influence all of those involved in the second humanity. That's, that's what Paul is teaching in both of these, certainly. But I just want to deal with how um, this verse is sometimes taken to teach universalism. So let's look at some other passages in the Bible to reconfirm in our minds the fact that you know, the Bible is not teaching that all people are going to be saved in the end. Uh, let's look at John 3, 16 through 18. Now, if you're looking for a verse about the love of God, you know, we just talked about the book Love Wins. What does the love of God look like and what is its result? If you wanted to find that out, it might be hard to find a better verse to go to than John 3.16, right? So let's look at John 3.16 and then the two verses that follow it and see if the love of God pictured in John 3.16 might get us to universal salvation. Somebody like to read John 3.16 through 18? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Yeah, so even in the context of the love of God for sending the sacrifice of Jesus into the world, telling us how God loved the world, like we talked about a little while ago when we were in John chapter 3. And verse 17, that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. You know, very very strong positive grace language here. Gospel language. But even as close as verse 18, we can't forget that there are two specific categories of people, those that believe and those who don't believe. And there are very different results depending on which of those two categories you fall into. Reformed theology will teach um, that, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that the world isn't the world. Like we were saying, all doesn't mean all. Well, they will say that, you know, because of limited atonement, they will say that the world doesn't mean everybody, doesn't mean the world. And then they go, if you go back to the Greek, and I forget the word, but... Yeah, it's, com it's about cosmos. That argument, you know? um, I, I don't think that's a very convincing argument. Um, there, uh, when we were in, when we were in John chapter three, we talked a little bit about some issues surrounding that. That the primary thrust of the world there in John three is not um, necessarily universality versus a particular view of the world, which I, that doesn't. You really have to shoehorn that in there to make it fit. I think universal understanding of that is certainly fits better with the context. But his primary emphasis there is not on the uh, the largeness of the world. It's it's not surprising because the world is so big. It's surprising because the world is so bad. World in John is particularly focused on sinful humanity. That God loved even sinful humanity enough that He would send His Son. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That includes Jesus. everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. Yeah, world. In John 3:16, I, th I think it's a, I think it's wrong. I, I don't think it's good exegesis to try to determine who yeah. that there's that it, that's limited to the elect, which is the argument that you're referring to. Yeah. No, I, no, I don't think that really holds water. Um, but also to be fair to um, Reformed theologians is that not all of them try to make that distinction here. That that is the way that some some of them read that passage, but not all of them do. I mean, those are the five point guys. You know, I think most Calvinists are four pointers. They you know they subscribe to all the limited atonement. Yes, I mean, yeah, the ones I've read. And, 
Yeah, it's a it's a complicated issue. We can get into some of the yeah we can get it into some of the details about how all that fits together. Um, but it, main point here is that even in a con, in the, even in the context of the love of God and the gospel and Christ not coming to con, to condemn the world, you have clear teaching about a, a distinct separation of people's eternal destiny depending on what they do with Jesus. So let's look at the next passage, Matthew twenty five. This is a little bit longer passage. We we won't read the whole thing. But this is the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know, you, you may have heard people, I've heard people say before that they were red letter Christians and they just believed the words that Jesus spoke in the Bible more than all the other words. Um, so that's an illegitimate form of interpretation. Uh, for a lot of reasons. I think we've talked about this a little bit before. But even if you do just think the red letters, most of the things that people are trying to say by that, you, you can still find a place that Jesus himself teaches. Um, for instance, if you were a red letter Christian trying to say that Jesus is going to save everybody in the end, well, you still run into Matthew 25 with the sheep and the goats. So, you know, here's some red letters that state the, the same thing that we're saying with all the black letters, too. Um, so this is talking about the judgment, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. And I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a, see you, you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. So that's the sheep on one side. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, then you will not do for me. And then the strong verse in number 46, then they, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So you have two parallel ideas there of eternal punishment and eternal life. So there's some pretty significant consequences for doing something like uh, some people try to do with a purgatory-like doctrine or saying that hell is only temporary and sin is purged out and then they get into heaven, something like that. Um, if one is not eternal, then what makes the other eternal? Uh, there, there are two very parallel ideas here going in different directions. And uh, language here is really, really strong. So the idea that the Bible is teaching that everybody is going to be saved in the end, again, just is not going to hold water. Uh, from these verses that we've looked at, uh, plenty of others that we could have chosen. The last, last example here tonight is from Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation 20, would somebody read verses 11 through 15 for us? Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as reported in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Yeah, yeah, that's good. yeah so these are some, 
strong judgment passages in the um, in the New Testament about uh, you know really really dealing with this issue. So the fact that we have a couple verses that if you took them in isolation could could construe them to say well Adam covered all Adam's sin covered all people therefore Christ's death is going to cover all people. Just because you could possibly do that if you took them out of context and tried to make them say something that they're really not trying to say in their context. The, the entire Bible is so clear on the fact that there are two possible eternal destinations and that without faith in Christ, we are clearly going to hell. And with faith in Christ, we are clearly going to heaven and receive God's grace and his love for all eternity. And these are two parallel eternal destinies that, that people can go to. Uh, there's just really no escaping that fact. And a couple verses taken in isolation are really not going to get you very far in trying to, teach, trying to say that the Bible teaches something different than that. All right. Let's look at our next example. John chapter 15. Verses 2 and verses 6, primarily. Now, we were in, when we were talking about taking verses in context, we dealt with a couple different passages that uh, were sometimes taken in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6 and 10, were sometimes taken to teach that somebody can lose their salvation. And this example is along the same lines. Somebody read... John 15, go ahead and read verses 1 through 6 for us. That way we'll get a little bit of the context. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does, anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire, and burned. All right, thanks, Richard. So particularly verses 2 and 6 here, with the analogy that Jesus is using, uh, could be taken, and are sometimes taken by some, to teach that a Christian could really be saved, authentically saved, and then lose their salvation, to use the imagery that's here in the passage. They could be cut off of the vine. It would be a branch that's really a part of the vine, and then they would be cut off with a, you know, with a knife or with some hedge clippers or, yeah, whatever you're using, a uh, gas-powered trimmer if you're out here on our work days, the big one on a stick like David Eggleton has. Somehow you're going to get cut off of that branch. You know, the branch was attached, and now it's not attached. It's laying on the ground. Um, so you have that. You have verse 6. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. So you talk, you have language that's talking about being in me or in Christ. And that's very strong salvation language in some parts of the New Testament. So there are some aspects of this that, that really do sound like there's somebody who is secure and in Christ and attached to him and then is cut off and is no longer a part of it is thrown, thrown away into the fire. So what are we going to do with a, with some passages like this? You open up a great can, a can of herring there. <laughs> one saved, always saved. Uh -huh. That's another one. Yeah, right. well that's really the, the issue that we're talking about that's here. Right. Is, one saved, uh, one, can somebody saved. be authentically saved and then lose their salvation? That's the, that's the question we're looking at. Because some people take these verses and say, yeah, somebody can lose their salvation. See, they're being cut off. They're a branch that was in the vine, and now they're cut off from the vine. So isn't that what Jesus is teaching here? I think that kind of refers to the fact that maybe they weren't authentically saved. They weren't completely in Christ. This is good. That, that's a, it's a valid point that 
you're making, Ernie, and I agree with you ultimately when we get to the level of systematic theology. I think that's, I think that's what we are going to understand, and that's where we'll be when we get to the end of this example. But before we get there, I, I don't want us to jump to systematic theology too early before we are understanding the, the verses themselves and what are they teaching. Because really, in order to do good systematic theology, which is putting all the different doctrines together, we have to do good exegetical work first. And it's tempting sometimes when we run up against a verse that doesn't seem to fit real well with our systematic theology, that we just kind of brush it off and say, well, I know that it teaches other places the other thing, so I'm just really not going to pay much attention to it. And I want to, I want to encourage you to avoid doing that. And to be as fair as you can, it's kind of like Sunday. We talked some in the message about some of the statements Jesus was making in John chapter 6. And I said that they really apply to the doctrine of election. Now, I didn't go into Arminian and Calvinist views and all this kind of stuff. Um, and you, really, you could talk a lot about those things if you're going to deal with that subject. We just don't have time to do that on a Sunday morning when we're trying to get through more than half of a chapter of the Gospel of John. Um, and there definitely be time to do that at some point in the future. But, you know, some, some people came up to me afterwards and were asking about some of those details and how, how do all that fit together. Um, and the, the main thing that I wanted to get across Sunday morning was that we needed to stay in John 6 and deal with what John 6 says and teaches there. Let's do that first before we, start, before we get to the theological labels and the systematic theology and those things like that. Let's make sure we're understanding John 6 first. And then, after we understand that first, that's going to be one brick in the wall that we're building. And then we're going to go to some other passages and understand those passages rightly. And then when we get them all together, that's when you have your systematic theology. But we don't, we, we don't want to short-circuit it. We've got to make sure we're staying at the, at the small verse level. We've got to understand those properly first. And that's what I want, to, want us to do here, is make sure we're getting John 15 right before we jump to the systematic level where we're saying once saved, always saved, and, and those kind of things. I, I was thinking that it said, every branch in me, to me, that says, I'm a believer, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It's like a believer not bearing fruit, God just takes him. God just takes him. Maybe prematurely, just takes him. If you're not going to bear fruit, God's just going to take him. I don't know. It's this very... Is, well, the... <clears throat> I don't know, with the, with the saying that he... They're cut off, and then when you get down to verse six, they're being thrown into the fire. That's a oh. that's some pretty strong language. So I, I don't think it would I don't think it would be best to understand that it's just like taking them like let them die early. I think this might be speaking to something like a chastisement. Well, certainly there is a, a discipline. Yeah, there is a discipline aspect where it says um, every branch he, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So there certainly are discipline. Bearing aspects. fruit is works. Right. right. So if you go to James 2 and it says faith without works is dead, you know, which is another verse that you know, gets taken out of context. But in order for faith without works to be dead, that means a condition known as faith without works must exist. Right? Or, or so it's dead faith. Yeah, but some people were claiming But it's faith. still faith. And you're still saved. But that's like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and then 10. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, prepare like your faith under your mm -hmm. to do good works. works. And yeah. then we are his craftsmanship. So you can be saved, but then you may be fruitless. My, one of my notes does talk about the, you know, that could mean, it could mean death, you know, uh, it says cuts off, the word may mean this literally, and would then, as take away in 1139, and would therefore be a reference to the physical death of fruitless Christians, or it may mean lift up, as pick up in 8. 59, which would indicate that the vine dresser encourages and makes it easier for the fruitless believer, hoping he will respond and begin to bear fruit. Okay. Yeah, those are some attempts people have made. I, I don't find either one of those particularly convincing. We'll, we'll get to that, that in a minute. Did you have something, sir? It reminded me of um, Romans 11 and that verse. I don't know if they're the same thing, but it got me so frightened I got on a plane and went to Africa two weeks later because I didn't want to not have enough faith and not believe and not obey enough to be cut off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's talking about how the nation of Israel was cut off. Yeah. And other branches were grafted. And there's some more gardening language and metaphor. That's a good example of 
two different writers in two different contexts using a similar metaphor. So, so we, yeah, we definitely need to be careful that just because they're using Gardner lang type language doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to inform our understanding of each other. They may be very different subjects that are going on there, and that, they do seem to be, I think, in those two passages, different subjects. There may be some cross uh, truth that's going on there, some things that can help us inform each other. But uh, but overall, you know, I'd say let's keep them separate, make sure we're understanding each one individually first, and then maybe just see what application they share. So what are we going to do with John 15? Well, let's look at a few of these verses. Remember last week I said that when we're working with this principle, it's often most effective to go to passages that are written by the same author. And even if you can go to the same book, the nearer the context, the better. But let's first look at John 6, 39, which is one of the verses we talked about on Sunday. John 6, 39. This is John's Gospel, again, quoting Jesus. Jesus' words here. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So even though... Chapter 15 sounds like Jesus is losing some, that they're connected to the vine and then they're not, it's not working out, so they're cut off. John 6 is telling us that Jesus doesn't lose any of those that the Father has given him. That I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. So there's some there's a lot of security that's going on there in John 6. Um, and some a number of other places in John. Uh, I think John chapter ten. We get to no one can pluck no one can pluck you out of my hand. Uh, John chapter ten. Yeah, ten twenty eight twenty nine. It's up there on the screen. Flip over to chapter ten. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Yeah. And the Father of all. Yeah. So a lot of parallel concepts there in chapter 10 and chapter 6 as well. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all. He says in chapter 10, uh, verses 28 and 29, I'm giving them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the, the unity of the Father and Son there that we saw back in chapter 6 as well, that I've come to do the Father's will, not my own will, and He has given me these people, and I will not lose them, and no one can snatch them out of my hand, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Really, uh, really two great passages that do inform each other well. I think uh, similar topics, same author, so that's an example of two, uh, two, exa two times where a metaphor is used that it really does inform each other well versus the Romans um, passage that, that we were talking about just a minute ago. Then you've got Romans 8, 29 and 30. Somebody like to read 8, 29 and 30? For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. All right, thanks, Ernie. Um, there's a lot, they, a lot of different de details and topics that come into this passage and really 28 through 30. Uh, but the main one I, is just those last two phrases of verse 30 that I want to point you to in this connection. Is that those he justified, he also glorified. And it, you notice it's, it's spoken in the past tense, even though glorification is something that's yet in the future for us. When Jesus returns, we're, we'll get our glorified bodies and that's when glorification is going to happen. But even though it's something that happens in the past, or that happens in the future. Paul relates it as something that's in the past tense. And it says, those he justified, he also glorified. 
So is there someone who was once justified who is not also glorified? This verse doesn't leave any room for that. It says, if you're justified, those he also glorified. So there's no room in this passage for anybody who's once justified and then later is not glorified. So when you put this together, and we've, we've had to do a little bit of what I was uh, warning Ernie about <coughs> earlier, that we've jumped a little bit into systematic theology because I, I need you to see that the, the testimony of the Bible, I believe, is that salvation is something that's secured by God himself, and that he doesn't let us go, and that people don't lose their salvation. Um, so when we get back to John chapter 15, how do we understand it? And like Ron mentioned in his study notes, or Luke mentioned, which sounded real similar to some of the things that Ron was reading in the, in the study notes, what are some different ways that we could understand John chapter 15 and say, okay, maybe all this really does fit together in the end. Maybe it does all harmonize because maybe God really is the author of all of this and it's inspired and he's teaching the same message and he's not contradicting himself. One of the ways of looking at it is the fools do not bear fruit. Question mark. Being justified. That could be. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> I'm sorry. Let me, tell, let me tell you the, the way that I think it's best to understand John 15 and passages like it that sound apparently like someone is losing their salvation when ultimately I don't believe that's what's going on. I don't think the Bible has any problem talking about apparent believers, professed believers, as if they are truly saved. Not making any determination or judgment as to whether they really are or not. I think there are a number of places, and the passage in Hebrews is a lot the same way. It talks about those who have tasted the Holy Spirit. And get, yeah, Hebrews 6 and chapter 10. The Bible often speaks of people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and go along with the church for a little while. It talks of them as if they are authentic believers. And then we find out later that they leave Christianity, that they deny Christ, that they revert back to Judaism or something like that in the book of Hebrews, we find out that they're not truly, that they, that they leave Christianity. And the question is, how do you fit that, that picture together? How do you fit all the, the pieces of the puzzle together? And I think the answer is that when you see the theological teaching that salvation is something that's secured, that those who are justified really are glorified, but you also see the teaching of the Bible that there are some people who are apparent believers but then who shrink back and end up not being believers in the end, is that you can talk about people who are part of the vine because they look and act and for all intents and purposes are a believer, outwardly speaking. And that's all that's being taken into account there. And then they stop bearing fruit, they're cut off from Christ, they they stop attending church. There's no works in their life anymore. Maybe they even go so far as to say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. These kinds of things. And then, metaphorically speaking, instead of being part of the vine, they're cut off and they're, it's visible that they are removed from the vine. But that's not necessarily making a theological statement about whether they really were saved or not in the, in the beginning. It's only making a statement about the outward appearance of things. Um, something that goes along the lines well, I saw a discussion online this week about how long should you wait before you baptize somebody. Um, because some churches, after somebody gets saved, they got to go through a class, and they got to do this, and they got to do that, and all that, and then they get baptized. And there's some good intention behind that, because you want to make sure that people are not uh, getting saved when they don't really understand the gospel, or that, you know, that they're not... Uh, you know, at church I was at one time, a guy, high school guy and his family came up and they said, we want to join the church, we want to be baptized, and he got baptized and he never showed up again. And come to find out, looking back on it, we put two and two together, it was like part of his Boy Scout stuff, like it joining the church with it. I guess he got a merit badge for that or something. <laughs> you know, so you want to avoid stuff like that. People joining the church, getting baptized for the wrong reason. That, definitely so. But when you look at the 
the way the early church is acting in the New Testament. Um, Philip witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch. He gets saved and then he baptizes him right there on the spot. There doesn't seem to be that disconnect between belief and baptism. And the argument is, well, if you do that, then you're going to have a lot of false conversions. You're going to have a lot of people that profess Christ initially, and then later they're going to turn away. And that is a danger, but it seems like a danger that the New Testament was, the, the early believers and the apostles were willing to live with. Um, so it's probably something we should be a little bit more comfortable living with too, just because that's the example that we see from them. But when they were baptizing people, they were not saying, we absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt that this person is saved and that they're going to heaven when they die. They were saying, this person professes Christ and they want to be baptized, so we're baptizing them. And that's all that it took. And I think that's all that it takes for Jesus to say you're connected to the body here, is a professed believer. And I think that's all it takes for the book of Hebrews to say they've tasted in the gift and they've seen the Holy Spirit at work and all, all the things that are described there. That's all that it's saying is that they've become a professed believer and we're assuming that that's authentic. But we're holding judgment and saying it may not be because like John says uh, in 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. So it's possible to have professed believers who later you find out they're not really saved. And I think that's what's happening in John chapter 15. So they just got wet. Yeah. What about Matthew 7, 21? Where the true and false disciples. Um, you know, there's people on the other side of the corner. There's people that claim to believe in Christ and then later in life, you know, go, go their own way. But then there's people that claim, you know, Christ and do good works for Christ their whole life, but they're not saved because they don't understand the gospel. They think they can get, you know, they have to do their own works or, you know, yeah. But, you know, as far as the, another good thing about Matthew 7, you know, where Jesus says uh, that I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say I used to know you. It says I never knew you. Yeah. You know, so yeah. <laughs> that, that speaks to, you know, once saved, always saved, because he never knew them. He didn't say, yeah, I knew, used to know you, but, you know, the last 10 years, you haven't really done much for me, so sorry. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, and I think... That, yeah, that's I mean, it's funny, but it yeah. says I never. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great point. And I think a lot of this goes, well, some with the analogy that I gave on Sunday about being out front of the stage and watching the play take place versus being behind the scenes. And the behind the scenes stuff is the theological reality that we know of eternal security and perseverance and things like that. But a lot of times the Bible is comfortable just sitting out in the audience describing what is seen going on on stage. And what is going on on stage is that somebody says, I believe in Jesus, I'm baptized, I'm a part of the church. And then 10 years later, they're nowhere to be seen. They don't care anything about spiritual things. There's no evidence that God's working in life and they're not really saved. And the Bible's comfortable talking about the front stage view, looking at the stage view, the practical aspects of it. And it's also talking at other times about the backstage view where you're seeing the inner workings of how it all fits together. And neither one of and they, they can both be true at the same time, and there's no problem with that. Um, so I don't I don't think it's any problem in John 15 for him to say somebody's cut off from the vine. Because he's just sitting out in the audience watching the play. That's what it looks like. Somebody was a Christian and they stopped, so they were cut off from the vine. And later on you can go back and Head backstage and see well how did that really all transpire? I but, think that, that those are the ones like uh, what Paul is saying on Second Corinthians five seventeen. You know those in Christ are new creation. The old was a new coming, and they've never been the new. They're not. They're not new creation at all. Yeah. When I became a Christian, I was twenty. Me and one of my parents would come to my my baptism. Because they, they said I've been baptized. I, I tried to tell them, no, say I was wet as a Catholic. I was wet as a Episcopal. Wow. I'm going to baptize a Christian. Okay. But they said you've been baptized twice. Mm -hmm. They would not come. Yeah. And of course, they, they were Christians, but they didn't understand at all. Yeah. So one of the things about the, the vine dresser pruning us, we're never so close to the vine dresser when we're being pruned. Yeah. Yeah, so that will be even more fruitful. I mean, when you look at this verse, there's no time frame. So, and what I mean by that is, okay, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So, let's say hypothetically, 
you know, next week I'm just, I had an off week and I just don't come to church and I don't read the Bible and I don't pray and I, you know, maybe live a little worldly and I go to the bar, you know, whatever, for a couple of weeks. Well, I'm not bearing any fruit for that week. You know, maybe I back a little bit, maybe something happened in my life. So I might cut off. And then the next week I'm like, you know what, I really need to go to church. And I start bearing fruit again. So do I, do I grow back? You know, I mean, it's a ridiculous argument to me. Like, you lose your salvation, you get it back. You lose right. your kid, you get it back. You know? I don't think yeah. I would lose it. I mean, if I go and do something that I should have done, you mm-hmm. always go to the Lord. Yeah. You come to Him and say, hey, look, yeah. this is the thing I've done before. I think it is. It says that mm-hmm. no, no sin you commit after you're saved is yeah. on your record, right? I mean, it's. <coughs> I think one of the one of the one of the things we're going to be for. Church problem would be, I see that. Uh, the difference between the ones who have never been reformed or really got used as opposed to the ones who are, who are saved and yet have backslided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, I think... You yeah, a lot... You, it takes a lot to think about how all that fits together. So, I don't, we got about 10 minutes left. I want to go ahead and get to our next two examples. I don't want to try to fit it all together tonight, but we'll have, we'll have time to talk about it all that uh, again soon. The next one, Acts 2, 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So Acts 2, 4, and I won't, uh, I'll go pretty quickly through both of these examples. The reason I bring this example up is because there are some groups that teach if you haven't spoken in tongues that you're not really saved. I'm not sure if uh, the distinction holds up perfectly, but the way I've heard it described sometimes is that Uh, There are different categories of um, Pentecostal slash charismatic believers, uh, whereas charismatic believers believe that some Christians speak in tongues and others don't, and it's better to speak in tongues than to not speak in tongues, but you can still be saved. Uh, The distinction between charismatic and Pentecostal is that Pentecostal would actually go so far as to say, if you haven't spoken in tongues, then you're not really saved. So there's charismatic, and then the next step would be Pentecostal. Well, they weren't listening to Paul. Yeah, well, that's true. Well, that's what Paul we're going to look at. That, that's, you know, if you want to speak in tongues, you can speak in tongues, but if you were to speak in tongues, make sure that somebody is there that would be able to interpret it. Yeah. And if you want to speak in tongues, go in the closet mm-hmm. and pray. Yeah. And if you are capable of doing that, something the Lord give you, that's fine. But it just wasn't something that was supposed to be in the church. And Paul said he and him, him himself that he spoke in tongues right. when he spoke to the Lord. Yeah. But he did not do it outside when he had his sermons. Yeah. So the, the real question we're dealing with is, do we have example or teaching in the Bible of people who are authentically saved, real believers, who are not speaking in tongues? Because if we have examples of that, then that's going to shut down this argument that you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. And we do have a couple examples. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now this does deal with some spiritual gift issues that we talked about. We had a series on spiritual gifts a couple months ago. So this may be some familiar material for for you if you were here during that time. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Would somebody read verses 7 through 11 for us to get started? Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. All right, thanks, Rob. So you have tongues listed among a list of other gifts, and Paul says that the Spirit sovereignly gives gifts to each person as He determines. So it's not like everybody who's saved gets all of the gifts, or that even that there are specific gifts that everybody gets. The Who gets the spiritual gifts is determined by God himself. He's the one who gives them, and uh, he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So we have some strong teaching here in 1 Corinthians that we don't have any expectation for Christians to have any one particular spiritual gift. And now, even some more 
I think it's a little, even a little bit stronger in verses 29 and 30. Somebody read those two verses for us. 12, 29, and 30. And you can go on to 31 if you want to. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Yeah, and this is explicit teaching that not everybody, not all Christians speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Because the answer to each of those questions is an assumed no. That's a rhetorical <clears throat> device. If you wanted to turn it around, if you wanted to make it not a question, but make him say the same thing, you would say, all are not apostles, all are not prophets, all are not teachers, all are not miracle, all do not work miracles, all do not have gifts of healing, all do not speak in tongues, all do not interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. You can't get any more clear than that, that there are some believers who do not speak in tongues. So, the, expli the explicit teaching here overrules the imp the implication that some people are trying to draw from a verse like Acts 2, that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the next step or a, a necessary result of the filling of the Holy Spirit is that you're going to speak in tongues. And Paul says, no, not all speak in tongues, not all interpret, not all are apostles, not all are prophets. So um, that's a good thing to remember, uh, a good principle to remember. And it really applies well with the John passage we were just looking at with the vine and the garden, is that implicit or implication gives way to explicit teaching. So even though you could say it's an implication that branches are being cut off so people are losing their salvation, that's not the explicit teaching of the passage. That's just an implication from the metaphor that's being used. So even though that you could draw an implication there when there's explicit teaching in other places that people that truly say people do not lose their salvation and that all those who are justified are glorified, then that means that the implication that we were trying to draw from the metaphor from the other passage isn't going to stand up. So we, we look first for explicit teaching and let that govern the implication of the other verses that we're reading. So implicit gives way to explicit. Is, a, is another way to talk about Scripture interpreting Scripture. All right, let's look at one more example. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. What will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? We mentioned this earlier on in our series as a great example, and this is probably one of the best examples of a truly obscure passage that we just don't know what it means, needing to be informed by other passages. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, in the context of Paul talking about the resurrection, the Mormon church teaches that people can be baptized for dead relatives and other dead people. You can be baptized on behalf of them and contribute to their salvation. Um, so, somebody might have been lost, but if you go back and you're baptized in their name, you know, say, find your great-great-great-grandfather, say, I'm going to be baptized for... Uh, you know, whatever Mr. Hobbs' name was that I'm dumped under, and uh, well, that's bad. He's saved now. That's what, the, that's what the Mormon church teaches, and that's the reason that they have the most extensive genealogical records of anywhere in the world, because they have done this family tree research to go back and be baptized for their dead relatives. Um, and that's what, they, that's what they teach, and they take this reference out of the Bible and maybe some of their own documents to support this, but this obscure reference from 1 Corinthians to say, well, see, there's baptism for the dead being taught in the Bible. Well, the reality is that no such thing like that is being taught in the Bible. Paul is referring to some people who are baptized for the dead, but he's not even clearly commending them. It's very, it's very possible, and I think, more, I think it's more likely, that this is a group that, is not, that Paul is not commending and may be in error in a lot of ways, but Paul was saying that even those who practice baptism for the dead, whatever that means, and whatever it meant, it certainly wasn't what the Mormon church is teaching it to mean now. Whatever it meant, they, they were doing that. And look, even this group that has so many things wrong is baptizing people for the dead because they believe in the resurrection. That's Paul, Paul's whole argument, 1 Corinthians 15, is that yes, there is going to be a resurrection. 
So even these strange groups that are baptizing people for the dead uh, are believe in the resurrection. So if they believe in the resurrection, shouldn't you believe in the resurrection? That I think that's where his argument is going in First Corinthians 15. But we have a couple different places in the Bible that explicitly teach that once we die, our eternity is sealed. That there's no switching one way or the other. One short verse for that is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. You may be able to quote, quote it in the King James or something. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And the, the point of this verse in its context is the finality of that act of judgment. Is that we die and then are judged and, then are, and that is sealing our eternal fate. So that, that is strong, explicit teaching there. That's probably the strongest single place in the Bible that teaches exactly that. I mean, that they just teed off on this particular issue that your fate is sealed at the moment of death. But another fascinating story is a parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And... The rich man goes to hell, and, the, and Lazarus, the poor mm -hmm. beggar, goes to heaven in this parable. That's the beginning. I encourage you to go back and read it. But at, when you get to the end of this, listen to what Jesus, how Jesus puts this parable together. Uh, this is the rich man asking Jesus. He answered, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. I'm sorry, I'm back up one more verse. Verse 26. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great chasm that it has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So there is a great divide between heaven and hell, and there's no bridge to cross back and forth. Nobody that wants to go there can go there. Nobody that wants to come here can come here. There's a there's a great wall of separation that's there and there is no penetrating that wall is the story that Jesus is telling here in uh, Luke chapter 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. So the idea that somebody could be lost and then somebody that's still living on earth could be baptized in their place thus securing their salvation would be a direct violation of what this passage is teaching that no one can go. I mean if this baptism for the dead thing were true he would say, let me go back and tell my brother so that they could be baptized for me. You know, he wouldn't just be wanting to go yeah. back and warn them about, don't come to hell. Come, hey, get me out of here. You know, yeah, help, help a brother out here. So, very clear teaching in the Bible, explicit teaching that no people cannot be baptized for dead people and save them in any kind of way. So, uh, we're, even though there's obscure reference to Baptism for the dead in Romans, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's certainly not meaning what it's taken to mean in contemporary context. So, most churches, and really all churches that I know of other than the Mormon church, just understand this is an obscure reference, and we just don't really know exactly what he's talking about, but it bears very little import for us today. It's just... Not, it's just not important. It's a passing reference Paul made, and if it was something that he thought was important for us to understand, he would have taken a little bit of time to explain what it meant. So, when the Bible's unclear on something, leaves it obscure, we can be comfortable knowing that God's inspired His Word to tell us the things that we need to know, and if He left it obscure, that just meant it wasn't that important for us to know. All right? So that's our last example on Scripture, interpreting Scripture. Of this been an interesting uh, few examples for you tonight and last week as well. Like I said, next week we'll be moving on to another principle. Context was the big one. Uh, we spent four weeks there. None of the other ones will be that big, I don't think. But uh, we've got some, some more interesting ground to cover. So I hope this will help you understand and learn to read your Bible, taking into account other scriptures and other passages and how they all come into play Thank you. when you're interpreting. All right, well, let me pray before we head out tonight. Father, we thank you so much for our time opening up your word and trying to understand some of these passages and uh, really some difficult passages tonight. I've picked some intentionally hard ones to interpret and uh, to deal with. So uh, 
We pray that you have given us insight and understanding into your word. And I pray that the subject matter that we're covering would not be discouraging uh, to anybody that's here. Uh, because it does seem difficult and some of the aspects can be complicated um, because we're, we're dealing with some of, the, some of the hardest questions that come up in Bible interpreting. But uh, that you would use this to equip everyone here uh, to give us the skills to understand your word properly in its context and uh, fit it together with the rest of your, the revelation that you have given to us in your word. So thank you for everybody gathered here tonight. Uh, bless them as you go, as they go. Uh, bless those that we prayed for earlier as well, especially those in, with health issues. We pray for healing and for your strength for them. We ask it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.